Perhaps the most important question in life isn't what's the meaning of all this or why did your ex-girlfriend leave you, but why is it that during periods of success, something with inside you suddenly wants to throw it all against the wall? Why do we self-sabotage when doing so is undeniably against our self-interests? Since I was old enough to self-sabotage, I've long thought about why we do it at all. And much to my amusement, I've come up with two reasons and two cures. Hey, what? Why are you wearing a suit? Because I'm fed up of looking homeless every day. Reason number one is wanting to feel an emotional depth. We could argue a lot of life is mundane. True success is paved by doing simple acts repeatedly and oftentimes people don't live up to the fantasies we've created about them in our heads. A lot of change requires simple everyday actions, nothing fantastical and success takes a long time to come to fruition. And all of this can leave you in a grey gloom of emotional shallowness. If hard work is what it takes to become successful, then maybe it's best to shun your emotions and just knuckle down and do the work, you reason. But after a while, your desire for emotional depth returns, especially even more so because it's been ignored. Suddenly you yearn to escape the seriousness of discipline, to dance through the woods naked or go on a delightful date, or be in rapture over the beauty of life. I'm starting to sound like a poet. However, the way we go about satisfying our need for emotional depth isn't as simple as we think. What we usually do in order to achieve this escape is throw a spanner into the cog of our works so we can retreat into the feeling of depression, apathy, sadness and vulnerability. Perhaps one day you stop working at all, you binge eat chocolate, you watch YouTube all day, you message someone you shouldn't, and you abandon your good habits, grand mission for your life and your work project. Instead of giving yourself the proper restoration that you crave, maybe by journaling, walking through the woods or meditating, you huddle under the covers until noon. You scroll on your phone for hours on end and you do anything to avoid facing your good habits. Suddenly, in your self-imposed doom of self-sabotage, you then start to think of all the reasons as to why you're not worthy enough to do the thing. Change your life, become successful, achieve the one thing that's on your mind. And so you morph your feelings of depression into inadequacy and inferiority. So seeing it from this angle, why would anyone do this? Why do we do this? We do this so when we bounce back by escaping the rut, the emotional high we feel is even greater due to the contrast in emotion between our defeated state and our success pursuing state. To elaborate, when you get your life back on track after self-sabotaging, it feels great. You're off to the races again because you got the emotional depth you were searching for. You feel exhilarated, enthusiastic, focused and energetic because a week prior you felt depressed, lethargic, demotivated and confused. Your self-sabotage is a ploy you play against yourself in order to get the rest and retreat you so desire, but in the most counterintuitive way you could possibly imagine. So. Cure number one for self-sabotaging due to wanting to feel an emotional depth is feel an emotional depth throughout the day and rest before you're tired. So this is rather simple. Instead of forcing this emotional depth upon yourself through the lens of self-sabotage so you can swing on the pendulum from darkness one day to lightness the next week, negotiate, <laughs> negotiate with yourself and you might come to the conclusion that in order to knuckle down and do the work and be disciplined, you don't have to shun your emotions all of the time. Now, I'm not saying you have to be emotional because stoicism and all that, but what I'm saying is you do have to listen to your emotions at the end of the day, otherwise they will force themselves upon you whether you want them to or not. For example, maybe before doing a workout you feel languid, lethargic and docile. So you do the workout and you try your best, but then you return to what your emotions were trying to tell you and you listen to them after you finish your workout. And then maybe you realize you need more sleep or you need to process grief from a relationship that you previously ended that you haven't processed up until this moment. Additionally, allowing yourself to fall in rapture with the beauty of life in a conversation with someone or listening to a good piece of music after your disciplined pursuits can also act as a stabilizer against this self-sabotage and a stabilizer against the hard work that you're doing, whether it's rebuilding your life, striving for a promotion or getting your health back on track. So don't shun your emotions, listen to them as if they're giving you feedback on something and then channel them into the task that you're doing. Lastly, don't forget, the consistent plan you follow is better than the perfect plan you quit. So every day, if you're self-sabotaging because you've got incredibly high standards, which are good and everything, but will mess you up in the long run, instead of doing a three hour workout every day, just do 30 minutes. Instead of working five hours a day in your passion project, just do 45 minutes. Learn how to rest, 
before your self-sabotage teaches you how. Reason number two why we self-sabotage is mimetic distraction from others. The words mimes, the words, the word mimesis means to recreate through imitation, and it's a brilliant descriptor of the world we live in. When we're on the internet scrolling or when we're having a conversation with people in our lives, we're met with the shattering conclusion that we are incredibly susceptible to what other people want. Because we are social animals, humans can't help but be influenced by the desires of others, even at the expense of our own desires, which we've spent a long time uncovering. Perhaps after scrolling on social media, you then want to become a travel vlogger, or you want to become a high-flying sales broker, broker? broker, or the next fitness influencer. But not because you've come to the conclusion that you want to do these things through your own introspection and self-reflection, but because you've basically seen other people more famous than you, do these things so you want to copy them. So the sequence plays out. Quit what you're doing, switch boats, and do exactly what this person is doing. After all, it seems so easy by what they're showing, but for anyone who's actually engaged in this process and quit something that they're doing that they've deemed as intrinsically valuable to pursue a mimetic desire that has been cultivated through watching someone else do something, we've realized that all that follows through chasing these desires is a crisis of meaning. The second thing we must realize when we encounter such mimetic desires is the difference between thin and thick desires. A thin desire is a want of yours which holds no substance, much like a floating leaf in the wind, elusive to your attempts to grasp it and therefore never giving you the solace of actually handling it. A thick desire, however, is like the roots of a tree, sturdy, durable, grounded and deep fundamentally graspable. So if we explore this sequence a little bit further, we find something a little bit peculiar. The more time we spend on social media, the unhappier we are. Because social media is a platform for other people to show us what to want, mostly always at the expense of what we've already deemed worth pursuing in our life. And we can be sure that the desires of others will always manifest in our lives as a thin desire. So cure number two for remedy in self-sabotage due to mimetic desire is cultivate thick desires and forget the bigger picture. In other words, the cure is clarity and care. We need clarity over the intrinsic pursuits we're pursuing in life through the lens of our values, introspection, principles, and our desires. And we need to care for ourselves, in the words of Jordan Peterson, as if we're someone we're responsible for helping. Because you're unlikely to become an ascetic and renounce the world and to retreat into the mountains. So you've got to learn how to navigate the desires of other people without getting lost in them at the expense of what you want. Think back to a time in your life, genuinely, when you felt you was in the right place at the right time with the right people. And amidst all of the turbulence and suffering that was going on in your life, what period of your life were you going to sleep with a smile on your face ready to wake up for the next day? What was going on? Think back to those moments like a curious scientist, because those are where your thick desires reside. Lastly, forgetting the bigger picture stands as a prevention to overwhelming yourself with a grand vision for your life. Often we're susceptible to measuring our self-worth based on the gap between our current situation and the overall goal we're striving to achieve. But to measure yourself that way is the easiest way to become your own worst enemy. Could make you very successful, but at the cost of your mental health. So to forget the bigger picture, look at everything close up. Perhaps instead of focusing on a one year goal, you set weekly goals. Then when your motivation inevitably wanes in the middle of the goal pursuit, during the week, which is Wednesday or Thursday, always is for me, as we pursue our goal closure, you only have to deal with a few days of demotivation and being in a rut rather than months. And overall, we would do well to love ourselves as if our lives depended on it.